Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Natat Puvar Sayas Chakor. Na Kadishyanti Champare. Nirambur Dorayat Pranan. Kova Divyam Samasatam. Translation. Even saintly persons like Brigu, born previously, could not perform such severe austerities, nor will anyone in the future be able to do so. Who within these three worlds can sustain his life without even drinking water for 100 celestial years? Purport. It appears that even if a yogi does not drink a drop of water, he can live for many, many years by the yoga process though his outer body be eaten by ants and moss. Mm. Gorvani Pachari Ne Nirvase Sasun Yavari Pastyatya De Satari Ne Panchakalpa Tarubhisya Kripa Sindhu Be Bacha Patitanam Bhagane Bhyo Vaishnave Bhyo Namahona Mahajaya Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadakar Shiva Sari Gaur Mahdavin Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare Hare Hari Rama, Hari Rama, 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 Rama. So we're hearing about the austerities of Shmarani Kasipu, whose austerities are geared to gaining personal power. And what is that personal power? He's trying to overshadow the natural law, the material energy, that the material body will become immortal. Of course, that is not possible. The soul is the principle of immortality because the soul, as is described in the Bhagavad Gita, does not take birth, nor does it die, nor does it undergo transformations like the material body of us. Dhanib Kasipu is a demon, a Yatarakshasha, a very vicious person who is only thinking about his own personal aggrandizement. But he is performing such, as it says here, severe austerities that even Brigabhuni, one of the sons of Lord Brahma, who is very powerful, um, and he's the author of the Brigham Samhita and other treatises, and he could travel from planet to planet. But even here, he could not perform the austerities of Rani Kashipu. Rani Kashipu knew the yoga system and that he could maintain his life here simply through the process of yoga or pranayama, uh, where the life here is not affected by the transformation and the deterioration of the physical body. And so, uh, although he didn't understand that the material body is, can never be immortal, Still, he was trying to perform that because he he wanted power. He wanted to be free from death. <laughs> he wanted to live forever. Devotees can achieve freedom from death very easily through the process of bhakti yoga system, by which one hears and chants the glories of the Lord and engages in the process of pure devotional service. Under the strict guidance of Krishna's representative, the bona fide spiritual master. That process of immortality is the authorized process because the body is made out of elements that will eventually deteriorate. And so these elements, although they're eternal in essence, but not in their natural state. In other words, just like, for instance, you can take water put it on fire and boil it, and then it'll disappear and turn into a gaseous state. So the, uh, the atomic structure of the water changes from liquid to gas, 
And so the elements still remain, but they're now transformed. So matter can never be created or destroyed, but it can be transformed. And the basic principle of the body is that it deteriorates due to the element of the time factor. And so it cannot be, it cannot sustain its original situation. In other words, it has to become less and less over a period of time. And those who perform austerities based on uh, extending the body or uh, giving strength to the body like that, um, th that's possible, but what is the goal? The goal ultimately is material supremacy, greater forms of sense gratification available, and elevation to a higher state status within the material tabernacle. So ultimately, all of that austerity is useless because ultimately the body has to die. Um, so austerity is very much a part of life. Just like in our Krishna consciousness movement, Krishna speaks in the Bhagavad Gita, there's austerities in the mode of goodness, austerities in the mode of passion, austerities in the mode of ignorance, austerities to, according to the three categories of material energy. And each one has a particular motivation for performing those austerities. Um, and, but the devotees perform austerities neither in, the, in the, uh, any of the three modes. They perform austerities in order to free themselves from the bodily conception of life or the interference with the body in the process of devotional service. So in our, in our society, the austerities is to chant the holy names of the Lord, uh, the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. Um, that is the recommended austerity in this age. And because people cannot perform severe austerities, as were done like Vishwamrita Muni, when he wanted to uh, become powerful like a Brahmana, he... Uh, <laughs> He sat down in the in the summertime, in the in the middle of the hot sun with fires all around him, and meditated. And then, again in this winter time, up to his neck in ice cold water, in meditating. What was his goal? His goal was to achieve brahmatejas. He understood that brahmanical power was greater and had more facility attached to it than uh, Kshatriya Tejas, or Kshatriya power. So he wanted to become a Brahmana. And the result of his particular austerities is that when Indra saw that this, this yogi was performing this great austerity, he assumed that he was trying to take his position in the heavenly planets. Because that's another principle of austerity. People perform austerities to get power, position, wealth, facilities in the material. So the demigods become somewhat concerned when performing someone performs severe austerities. They think that they're going to take their position in the heavenly planets. And that's, of course, that is also possible. And um, so Indra sent, uh, you know, his society girl, the girl, Manika, to attract his mind, and his mind was attracted and broke his austerities. And um, he wound up marrying Menika, and then, of course, the famous Sukuntala was born out of that union. But she went back to the heavenly planets. After some time, he gave up the relationship with her, and he was somewhat regretful that he was seduced and so he performed austerities again with the desire that any society girl who would come or anything would come, he would destroy them. And so his austerity was so powerful that again, of course, Indra Sanda sent another society girl named Ramba. And when she came, uh, she, again, he, she tried to attract his mind, but 
he had performed the austerities of raising the fire in his body, and he was able to emit that fire out of his eyes, and he burnt Rama, Ramba into ashes. And as soon as he did that, he fell down from his austerities, because attachment and aversion are, this, are two, two parts of the same principle. To get attached to something, to become averse to something, is the same. Both are on the level of duality, and both are in the, within the material context. And so he was unsuccessful again, like that. So yogis, they perform austerities for some, but devotees also perform austerities, just like it says in the scriptures. The austerities of the devotees is, are the wealth of their devotion. So in our process of Krishna consciousness, um, the austerity is to chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra as given by the spiritual master every day and to follow these simple four rules and regulations, no illicit sex, no intoxication, no meat eating, and no gamble, gambling. These restrictions are a form of austerity because people are inclined to these activities. But these activities take one away from the process of devotional service and bring one to the bodily conception of life. These austerities or these principles that austerities are geared towards are the pillars of sinful activity in the material world. So one who can be free from these four forms of sinful activity can actually uh, elevate themselves through the process of chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. Right. And devotees perform other austerities, just like they fast on ak akadasi, or they also take on uh, vows of um, various types of services and personal restrictions like that. So austerity becomes a principle that gets one off the bodily conception of life. And there's certain denial of the senses, the mind, which uh, when geared, that denial is geared towards, uh, or that energy that was used for these activities is geared towards Krishna consciousness, then one makes progress in devotional service. So um, wealth is defined in different categories. Uh, the lowest form of wealth is finance, money, the uh, exchange that we use in the material world to get commodities and get positions in power. That's, that's called, or we call it money. That's the lowest form of wealth, according to scriptural uh, injunctions. Higher than that is knowledge. Knowledge is greater than uh, material wealth because it allows one to uh, move away from what is uh, detrimental for one's material and spiritual welfare and move them towards those activities which are beneficial. And ultimately, it gives one knowledge of the process of devotional service and Krishna. Higher than wealth is, is austerity because austerity gets one off the bodily concept of life. And therefore, most of the process of bhakti contains elements of austerities which which inspire the devotee towards Krishna consciousness. Just like we give up things that we like to do in order to serve Krishna and the desire to please Krishna. Putting our own desires, emotions, and feelings in the background and keeping service to Krishna in the foreground is one of the best forms of austerity. And ultimately, austerity leads to bhakti. Because without austerity, one cannot actually stay steady in the process of devotional service. Therefore, it's recommended throughout scriptures and given by the acharyas, uh, the principle of austerity. You see now, going back to the material realm, is that in the material realm here, the, the people can perform Dhruva Maharaj, perform tremendous austerity. 
he was standing on one leg and just performing the yoga system, meditating on the different bodily features of the transcendental form of the Lord in his mind and not eating and hardly even breathing. He was breathing very intermittently every once in a while. He became so powerful that the universal, universal breath was choked out by the power of his austerity. He became the center of the universe. But what was his goal? His goal was something material. He wanted to see the Supreme Personality of God in. Why? Not for worship of the Lord, but he wanted some material benediction from the Lord. He was insulted by his stepmother, and he wanted revenge by getting a kingdom. His father was the king of the world. He wanted a kingdom greater than his father. He wanted a kingdom greater than his um, uh, grandfather, Swayambhu Ramanu. And he wanted a kingdom greater than Lord Brahma, his great grandfather, who is the uh, is the uh, leader of the entire race of jivas. He is the supreme monarch within the material world, Lord Brahma. So he wanted a king, and there was no such kingdom available. But Krishna eventually satisfied his desire because when he when his austerities became mature. And the demigods were complaining to Lord Vishnu that, hey, this devotee, he's, he's trying to get your darshan and his austerities are destroying the universe. It's breaking our universal management. So you better go and do something to pacify him. So the Lord appeared to him, not because he had performed austerities to get the Lord's darshan, but because he was creating a disturbance. <laughs> And uh, when when he saw the Lord, he immediately, his mind became changed and he gave up all of his desire for material gain and he simply wanted to worship the Supreme Lord. Immediately, his devotion started to sprout and the Lord was pleased with that and eventually gave him a kingdom which is now known as the Post or also known as Dhruva Loka. So... But that's an example of one who is performing great austerities for something material. Here we have the same with uh, Rani Kasipu. He wants, you know, he he wants to be immortal. And you'll see as the verses go on, well, what type of immortality he apparently, apparently, we don't say he, he achieved, apparently got. And that is the basis of the whole pastime where the Supreme Lord Sri, Sri Nishringadeva appears and destroys all of his attempts for immortality. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So, yeah, one can perform miracles through the process of austerity, but what is the use? If, if austerity makes one hard-hearted, if austerity just gather, gains one something material, then... It is actually diverting one's attention to the real, away from the real goal of life, which is Prema Kumarta Maham, developing one's love for Krishna. So in devotional service, as one begins devotional service, there are recommended austerities. But as one makes progress in devotional service, the austerity falls away. And what happens is that one desires one develops a strong desire to please the Lord and serve the Lord and develop love for the Lord. And then that becomes the focus and no longer one performs all of the other austerities, although they may do it just to teach others, but they are on the spiritual platform or on the purified platform. And their whole goal is simply to uh, serve the Lord in, uh, in, in a way to please the Lord and develop love for the Lord. And that is the ultimate goal. So austerities are recommended in the scriptures. In the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna mentions a whole list of austerities. And austerities can be something that one takes on to build one's character. Austerities can be taken on as one to want to uh, avoid certain activities in the material sense, which will uh, bring one down into the material energy. Austerities are performed for different in different ways, 
But ultimately, the, the real, the essence of all austerities is that it's mentioned, Krishna Varna Tvasa Krishna Sangopanga Saparsanda Yagyai, Yagyai sacrifice, Sankirtanai Prayaya Jantihi Sumeda Sahat. The austerity in this age is to chant the Hare Krishna Mahamantra both in the process of japa and in the process of kirtan, not just one, but both. But Shaitanya Mahaprabhu sets the standard by which the austerity of kirtan becomes a prominent feature along with one's individual prayers, which we know as japa. And japa helps one to become inspired by kirtan, and kirtan helps to purify one's japa. And both of them are needed, and, and that is the recommended austerity in this age. And of course, the austerity is given by the guru in the process of uh, aspiring for a spiritual master, such as the four regulative principles which we mentioned earlier. So um, when one becomes accustomed to devotional service, then austerity automatically it becomes a natural thing. It's no longer something that one has to struggle in order to perform. One automatically wants to perform these austerities because it, it becomes a part of their process of executing devotional service and there is enjoyment. As it says, austerity is the wealth of the Brahmin class. In other words, those who are actually Brahminically in find great happiness and performing austerities, which leads them closer and closer to self-realization. So this is the process here. Um, it's interesting, the purport is, I only give one sentence, that even, even the yogis can dr not drink a drop of water for many, many years and, uh, and still live. It's interesting uh, many years ago, I came across one magazine while I was in India, and it was about a man who hadn't eaten or drank a drop of water in 62 years. He, it doesn't, didn't, the article didn't give much about what he did, but he was just, just re reframing from eating. He never ate anything. And he never drank any water. Sometimes, I guess, of course, we, we, we're not guessing, but we could understand that he was performing the yoga system. I didn't mention that in the article, but it just wanted to illustrate that this person had performed some type of miracle. So, yeah, yogis can do that. They can do that. They can also extend their lives for many, many years through the process of austerity. But an extended life is not really the goal of, of uh, an intelligent person. An intelligent person wants to use every moment of life that is available for self-realization. Trees live for thousands of years and what is the benefit and as far as the, the soul in the tree? So, yeah, so longevity of life is not the goal of austerity, although it may be a byproduct of austerity. What is the, what is the real austerity is to become Krishna conscious or to take up Krishna conscious and chant the holy names of the Lord and very carefully avoid those things that take one away, one's consciousness away from devotional service. So, um, there are many austerities that we, traveling to holy places is a type of austerity. And that should be also performed. That's one of the angas or limbs of bhakti. Um, visiting the holy places, uh, hearing from great personalities and performing, uh, uh, and performing devotional service in these holy places. Dila Prabhupada has uh, written in the Chaitanya Charitamrita, that all the devotees in the ISKCON society should visit all of the holy places that were visited by Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. 
Now, that's a pretty tall order, <laughs> but he writes it. And because uh, Lord Chaitanya traveled throughout all of South India and went to many, many holy places. And also he went to what is now known as, um, as uh, Bangladesh. He also traveled there and performed many pastimes there. But Prabhupada said that the best austerity is to continually chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra according to the directions given by the spiritual master. But he then, he did was very emphatic that devotees go to the holy places at least once a year for association with the great souls and to perform the activities of glorification of the Lord in these holy places. And specifically, he said that uh, during the Gaur Purnima festival uh, in Sridham Mayapur, every devotee in our society should come for at least eight days, this is the exact statement, eight days to celebrate Lord Chaitanya's appearance in the world. So that's coming up very soon within the end of March, March 24th, I believe, is the uh, is the day of Lord Chaitanya's appearance. And uh, the devotees will converge all around the world into this, in this holy place. And there are many spiritual activities that will be happening. And it's a wonderful opportunity to uh, solidify in one's consciousness in devotional service and get a lot of good association with great souls who come to the holy places. And, uh, and by serving great souls in holy places, there's no greater service that one can perform. So, yeah, so if we're not enthusiastic to make some sacrifice, we will never become Krishna conscious. And there has to be some personal sacrifice. But these sacrifices are very simple, as Srila Prabhupada said. Chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, dance in kirtan, and take only food offered to the Lord Krishna Prashadam. Those three activities are also a form of austerity. People like to eat all kinds of food, and there, if you go around the world, there are millions and millions of restaurants. Uh, everyone's opening a new restaurant. Everyone's figuring out some kind of exotic foods that they can uh, offer to the public. Of course, for some for, for some pecuniary benefit, and so restaurants are everywhere. The tongue is the most voracious and difficult to control. But we can control the tongue, which is a great austerity, by chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, uh, speaking about devotional service and the glories of the Lord, and avoiding food that is uh, cooked by non-devotees, uh, or not food that is not offered to the Lord in sacrifice. And uh, another austerity of the tongue is to uh, refrain from talking nonsense. People like to talk. Just when two people are together in a room, uh, they can't remain quiet. Just they feel like they have to say something. You know, so this idea of the urge to speak is a very strong urge. But it brings one's consciousness down towards the material level when one wants to speak about anything and everything. So therefore, it's recommended that the two austerities of the tongue, which is the foremost austerities, is to chant the holy names of the Lord, glorify the Lord, and take only food uh, offered to the Lord in devotion for Shadow. This is called sacrifice. It's called Yagya Buk, that sacrifice that elevates one's consciousness towards devotion. Um, so the process of devotional service is susukam kartavavyam, it's joyful. And when we perform austerities, we actually enter into the realm of joyfulness because these, these austerities get us off the bodily concept of life, which is the cause of all suffering. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Thank you, Maharaj Ji.
for the wonderful class, for the wonderful class, Maharaj. And this is such an important, um, uh, you know, uh, subject, which is austerity. And you said it's such an important part of our life. Yeah. And it is indeed an important part of a devotee's life at this age. Um, austerity is to chant Harinam, uh, Hare Krishna Mahamantra. And austerity is also the four regulative principles, you said, are forms of austerity and to elevate themselves to process to chant Hare Krishna Mahamantra. And, um, you know, these austerities becomes a principle. Um, that being said, um, Maharaj, you said even austerity is to offer first to the Lord and then the devotees need to consume, you know, uh, that prasad and uh, it should be cooked by by the devotees and then only you can you know consume that prasad right so th those are the very important uh, you know austerities but we do come across so many challenges um like even in the temple sometimes non-devotees are also cooking and we are brahminical uh, devotees right initiated devotees and then we hesitate and they just don't understand. And they'll say, why aren't you having the prasadam, right? But it's very difficult. It's very difficult to make them understand because they have not followed those um, regulative principles. Uh, you know, so it becomes very challenging. How do you deal with these challenges, Maharaj? I just had this question. That's the fault of the management. No one should be cooking yeah. prasadam who's staying in the temple. That's yes. why we have we have first and second initiation. Only those who are second initiated can cook for the deities or even cook for the devotees. We make Excellent. we made a little concession mm -hmm. based on, on the fact that sometimes a, a Brahmin cook is not available, so a mm -hmm. first initiated person can cook, but that's mm -hmm. concessionary. Srila Prabhupada set up the standard that only Brahmins can cook, mm -hmm. so. If that's not being done, then uh, that's the fault of the management. And uh, absolutely, and that uh, food that is being cooked by these uh, non devotees or, or uh, uninitiated devotees is not really prashadam because the Lord doesn't no. accept. It. The Lord won't accept that. Correct. We can we can make our own rules, but it's not going to. We don't. Uh, the Lord follows the standard by which is given by the spiritual teachers and not by us who decide to make our own way of doing things. Mm -hmm. So you can't say that it's actually prashadam. It's just, you know, food. That's all it is. Yeah, it's a tamsic food. Yeah, so we, we should uh, we should avoid taking that. And that should be that should be addressed by the leadership that they should organize uh, cooks that are authorized to cook for the deities and for devotees and, and of course, and for the guests who will come also, they get the remnants of the prasadam. That's one of our most important factors of temple worship, if not <laughs> the most important. Yes, you're right. It's the fault of the management, um, I agree. Yeah, we are we are trying. We are trying our level best um, to bring the reforms. Like you know, yeah. But some it's most of the time very challenging because if the leadership is not uh, very powerful, I mean, they're not following these rules and regulation which uh, our spiritual master Srila Prabhupada has struggled all his life, you know. And um, if we are not following those uh, principles, you know, it becomes very challenging for the devotees like us. But uh, nonetheless. Um, end of the day, we are chanting uh, Hare Krishna Maha Mantra so that, you know, we control our tongue as well, you know, to control the tongue is so important, you said, and those are the essence of, uh, you know, austerities. And I think when you start chanting, um, you know, and that ruchi comes in you, like, you know, you're, uh, you know, waiting to chant more and more. And I think that's the ruchi which will control our tongue not to have uh, no austerity stuff you know thank you Maharaj so much I won't uh, take much of your time I would uh, request other devotees if they have questions Maharaj you have time for questions I want to say one thing based on what you just said and Prabhupada yes. Yes. boiled it down he said Chen Hari Krishna and take Krishna Prashadam 
Yes. If, if, we're, if we're not taking Krishna prasadam or food that is offered to the deities, we can't really chant the holy names of the Lord. The mind becomes so disturbed. You know, prasadam purifies the body and the mind. And it allows one to chant the, the holy name more nicely and develop the taste. So yes. when we say just chant the Hare Krishna Maha, Maha Mantra, we include prasadam in, mm -hmm. in, in that. But that has to be there. That's Thank not you. Op not optional. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maharaj, for that wonderful answers. Yeah, let me see if devotees are uh, here. Yeah, uh, Sukhakara Prabhuji, uh, Dandavat Pranam, please go ahead with your uh, questions. You unmute yourself, uh, Prabhuji. No, we can't hear you. Unmute yourself. We can't hear you, Prabhuji. You so have I to unmute, Mark. Yes, Mark. unmute. Go to tomorrow, then we can come back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Oh, maybe Shiv Kumar uh, Prabhuji, you can uh, go ahead. Hare Krishna Mataji, thank you Mataji, the doubt prompts. That's Hare Krishna it. Maharaj, the doubt prompts Maharaj. Uh, Maharaj, in 17th chapter, we see that uh, the of the austerities listed for the mind Maharaj, satisfaction is listed as the first austerity. Uh, I just wanted to understand Maharaj. Uh, generally, we, uh, I mean, I'm speaking of myself. I still find pleasure in sense engagements, material sense engagements, and slowly moving to uh, being satisfied with the senses being engaged in the devotional uh, service or devotional activities. So when the satisfaction is listed as one of the austerities, Maharaj, what does that exactly mean, Maharaj? Is that uh, practicing satisfaction itself is an austerity? Yeah, satisfied with whatever comes by way of Krishna's arrangement. One should be satisfied with wealth that comes by its by a natural arrangement. One should be satisfied with one's wife. One should be satisfied with one's uh, one's uh, whatever food comes in, in the form of uh, prasadam. Mm. In other words, a sense of satisfaction means to being dependent on the mercy of the Lord. Mm. And therefore, whatever the Lord whatever the Lord allows to happen, whatever comes our way, we're, we're satisfied. Dissatisfaction mm. is because of material desires. That's all. Mm. Trying to fulfill material desires. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So one should be satisfied with the basic things of the world. And one should be satisfied with their with their with the process of devotional service one should not look outside of devotional service to find satisfaction okay 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 thank you thank so much for that Hare. thank you thank you for that yes um sukakara prabhuti yeah yes, actually, I, I, my line oh. like a, my line went off that's why i could not talk go ahead uh, Hare krishna thank you Mataji. Okay. Chandramali Maharaj, thank you again. You are with us just before the Ekadashi. You have to order the Ekadashi. So please bless us. Again, we beg you for uh, blessing us to get the pure devotion service. Maharaj, the question which uh, now Mataji was asking, it was a very serious issue. She also spoke to me. Aditi Mataji, she is she's following everything properly. She is a disciple of Gopal Goswami Maharaj. But the person who is running the show, he is the initiated disciple. But putting all the people who are not even initiated to do all the functions and all, and he's like a dictator. So she is worried how to get it sorted out. And Gopal Krishna Maharaj is in somewhere else, and how to make this happen. Since you are proper disciple, you can throw some light. Now, how she can, because she's not able to see with the eyes what is happening now. Well, there's a process of. Uh of management that allows for change and that is that one tries to solve the problem on the on the level that the problem is at if one cannot solve it on that level one goes to the next level where there is another authority over those who are in the position 
and then you can go all the way up to the GBC. So there's a process of retribution or a process of, of uh, filtering down. So um, if the temple president is breaking the principles, then ultimately the, the local GBC should be notified and there should be some correction. If the local GBC mm -hmm. is not available for some reason, mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. something can be sent to the executive committee of the, the GBC. Mm -hmm. And then, so there's a, there's a thing for checks and balances. Mm -hmm. But one should not allow deviations to go on in the name of just because it's convenient. Yeah. Should, yeah. So yeah, there's a process like that. So it's going on for many years and she's seeing the atrocities happening and she's feeling very... There are many senior people are leaving the place because all things going topsy yeah, sometimes, sometimes these temple leaders, they think, well, this person is a very good cook. And yeah. they're, they're very... They're yeah. Very, yeah. They're, very they're very responsible. They show up all the time. But they are not initiated. But there is a scriptural injunction that says that Krishna does not accept any food offered by per persons who are non devotees. Mm -hmm. And in this case, it means initiated. So, yeah. Uh, we have already brought down Prabhupada's standard from second initiation to first initiation. So yeah. then many temples allow for first initiation for, to cook. Even that is a is a lesser principle that, that what Prabhupada gave us. Uh, but ultimately, to have someone who is not initiated at all is uh, you, you can't call that prasadam. It's just not prasadam. <laughs> mm -hmm. Krishna is not, not going to accept that. That's a fact. <laughs> That there's a statement in that regard. Mm -hmm. Mother, you're to write to the GBC's security company. Thank you. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj, for throwing the light. And go to the raise uh, hands by Jyoti. Uh, Radha Jyoti Mataji, Dandavat Pranam. Please go ahead. Hare Krishna, Dandavat Pranam Mataji. Hare Krishna, Dandavat Pranam Maharaj Ji. Maharaj Ji, my question to you is, uh, uh, we see that the uh, the new joining or the devotees who are not initiated, they are very much interested in all the services. But when it comes to chanting, uh, they are reluctant. So the austerities in another other devotional services, it seems easy for them. But when it comes to austerity in chanting, it's difficult. It's difficult, I agree. But why it is so much of difference, why they are not interested to um, put extra endeavors and chant because they are devotees, they are not initiated yet, but they are not taking extra endeavors. So could you please teach on this? Harinam, 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 Eva Kevalam, Kalona, Stevana, Stevana, Stevagatya, Anvita. There's no other way, there's no other way, there's no other way than chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. It is the Yuga Dharma, it's the means for self-realization, and it is applied in all situations. In the in the in the Srimad Bhagavatam, it lists the nine angas or activities of devotional service. And it says that each one of the angas are are competent to give self-realization if one perfects that anga. But given then, but Srila Prabhupada makes the point that each one of them must be accompanied by the chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. So I give you an example of what happened in my in one of my experiences where I was in one particular temple in Europe and the temple president called me in and said, uh, Maharaj, I have this wonderful Pajari. She comes every day on time. She dresses the deities very nicely. She's very creative, but she will not chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. So what should I do? I said, well, uh, allow her to continue to do her service, but keep encouraging her in, in different ways that she should chant. 
And if she doesn't chant after a period of time, Krishna will kick her out. There will not, she won't be able to maintain that service. And so I left it at that. And then I, I gave some scriptural references to back up that statement that chanting must accompany all of the other activities in devotional service. And then I, uh, after three months, I had come returned to that same temple and I inquired about that lady. And he said, you're right, Maharaj. She After some time, I didn't say anything to her, he said, but she just left on her own. Yeah, because she's not following the instructions of the Param Guru or the, uh, the uh, what is it called? The Acharya, the, uh, what is it called? Uh, uh, Prabhupada is called the, uh, something acharya, foundational acharya. Whatever Prabhupada has given us as a standard for the execution of devotional service must be executed. It can be discussed how we execute it, but when it comes to chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, there's no, there's no discussion based on that. One has to chant, and one has to uh, come to the point of the initiation by chanting 16 rounds every day and following the four regular principles. So we can take their volunteer service and let them do some service, but um, after some time, they will, they'll go away because they are not chanting. The service will become a burden, it becomes like work. So uh, we let them continue to do service, but encourage them that they have to, they should perform the, the execution of the instruction of the spiritual master, which is the most important. Srila Prabhupada made that point. He said, my most important uh, instruction to my disciples that they must chant every day 16 rounds on beans without fail. He said, most important instruction. He didn't say important. So, yeah, uh, we want to encourage everyone, and we bring people in sometimes to the process of doing activity, performing some kind of uh, practical service. But it's just to get them into, into the association of devotees, and then from there they have to take up the process. Otherwise, they won't be able to stay in that association. <laughs> Yes, we, um, Maharaj Ji, you mentioned uh, there are a number of ways to encourage. So could you please mention on what are the different ways to encourage them? To encourage them? Yes, you mentioned there are various ways to encourage them. I yeah. want to know about these ways. Well, if you chant, you'll be happy. <laughs> we always say that, chant and be happy. If you chant, you'll please the Supreme Lord. If you chant, you'll follow the instructions of the spiritual master who has given you the process of devotional service. If you chant, you'll uh, free yourself from all suffering that comes by way of the material energy. Um, all of these things are chanting. We don't speak about the higher glories of chanting, such as entering into one's... Uh, uh, spiritual uh, identity in the spiritual world that we don't speak to not, to people in general that's a that's something that comes uh, after a certain uh, level of elevation in spiritual practice so different ways to encourage them um, if we can also say that uh, if you're in a position of leadership and if you don't chant, then I'll have to ask you to leave the services and we'll find someone else to take your service. So who is who is willing to chant? Because without chanting, then, then they miss the whole point. It's like the most important activity is japa and kirtan. It's, it, it's the yuga dharma. It's the means for self-realization in this age. Every age of the four ages of of human society, every every age has a particular means for self-realization. In this age, it's chanting of the Hare Krishna Mahamantra. 
Hari Nama, Hari Nama, Hari Nama, Eva Kevalom, Kalom Nasti Eva, Nasti Eva, Nasti Eva. Gatir Anyata. There's no other way, no other way, no other way. This verse was spoken by the Supreme Lord himself, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. He's giving the formula, and he's also demonstrating by his personal example the importance of chanting Hare Krishna. <laughs> and the scriptures support all of the activities of chanting by the, by talking about the glories of the holy name and the benefit that one achieves through the process of chanting. And for those who are on the highest platforms, sometimes they don't do anything but chant. That's all they do. Of course, you can't come to that stage, you know, surreptitiously or automatically or whimsically that comes by advancement but on the higher stages great souls they chant all day and pretty much that's their that's their absorption i know devotees who chant 64 rounds a day some chant yeah. 32 rounds a day and there's others who chant even more there's others who, who spend their whole life centered around chanting and Distributing the glories of the holy name to others. Chanting is the essence. Chanting is the basis. Chanting is the goal. Chanting is the means. Oh, Very thank you so much for the specific answer, Maharajji. Uh, you answered me very specifically. So I'm grateful for that. It will be easy for me to answer whenever I could get an opportunity to mention about the glories of the holy name in the way in which they could understand or they could easily uh, accept it. Thank you so much. Hare Krishna. Thank you Radha Jyoti Mataji for that wonderful question. Thank you Maharajji for that answer. Yes and the next is uh, Prahlad uh, Prabhuji, Prahlad and Prabhuji. Please go ahead. Thank you very much Mataji and then Prahlad to all and Maharaj. Uh, my question is regarding the Guru Hustle, like, uh, you know, where we, I'm uh, initiated by my wife, is not, and she's chanting some rounds. You cannot hear? Well, I cannot understand it. It's becoming unclear. Oh, can you hear me now properly? Uh, yes. If you're speaking a little slower and clearer. Okay, sure. Mm -hmm. sure. Uh, my question is, uh, for a devotee like me, who is at home, the wife is not initiated, but she chants and prepares uh, sattvic food without onion, garlic, and other things. And we are offering it uh, uh, with Tulsi Dhala. Will this be accepted by Lord Krishna or not? Because we are doing it sincerely. So, you know. There's a thing called Sankalpa that's mentioned. That in this home uh, form of worship, there should be a sankalpa. And that sankalpa is there. Um, I, I checked on this particular point when this incident came up. The sankalpa is that that lady should chant minimum four rounds. Mm -hmm. That's a sankalpa. And then she can uh, she can offer food to the deities and she can do a little worship at home. She can't do that at the temple, but at home she can. Because mm -hmm. um, home worship is less stricter. But exactly. In, uh, no chanting at all, mm -hmm. it's not going to be acceptable. So I, I, I did some inquiring from from some people who understand deeply the process of devotional service. And this person gave me this answer that there has to be a sankalpa, some vow of chanting. And the mm -hmm. sankalpa is a minimum of four rounds for those who are like housewives, who who are taking care of children, who have to manage the house, and you know, have a lot of responsibility. Uh, otherwise, you're qualified to worship the deity even at home if they don't do any chanting at all. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mara, because my wife does chant four rounds at least. And we uh, offer four rounds. Yeah, yeah that's right. That's right. so encouraging. Thank you very much for your answer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, wonderful question. And thank you, Maharaj, for that answer. I don't know whether uh, 
maybe I'll go to the next uh, devotee and then Sukhakara Prabhuji will come back to you. Um, it's Radha Vinodini Mataji. Uh, yes, Mataji, please go ahead. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada and all glories to you. Uh, may I ask my question about desires, which I, I sent an email to you, or shall I wait yeah. later? No, go ahead. It, it's, it fits in. <laughs> uh, okay. So there were two parts of the question connected to desires. Uh, one was that uh, if you could uh, uh, describe a little bit what is the difference between urges and desires. And the other was that... Uh, if the de desires are, uh, if if the mind or the soul is the, the source of desires, or both, or or how it works. Hmm. Well, urges are just uh, strong forms of desires that are that come out. That's all. An urge is another. It's, it's what is it? Is a desire that has a very strong emphasis on it. <laughs> Uh, as the word means uh, something that that springs up within one's consciousness, or one's life, and that pushes one in a direction very strongly to fulfill that. That's an urge, which is a desire, an urge for sex life, an urge for uh, for eating, an urge for uh, any of the activities of the senses can be categorized as urges when they are. When they appear without any apparent cause, and they are very strong, that's an urge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's just a that's an etymological definition of the word. Mm -hmm. uh, and the what is the 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 actual the mind is simply a reflection of the of the uh, the uh, desires of the living entity. So the desires of the living entity, the soul, cannot perform anything material. The soul is aloof from everything material. But the soul mistakenly thinks it is the body, and therefore it acts through the mind and the senses. So the desire is coming through the mind and through the senses, based on the soul's uh, uh, desire to enjoy in this material world. So everything is performed by the body, the mind, the senses, the intelligence of that. The soul doesn't touch it. And just like the, the, the perfect example is a dream. In the dream, one is experiencing various types of uh, activities in the dream, but nothing really is happening on the physical level. Generally, sometimes something does happen on the physical level, even in dreams. But... It, it's actually a subtle form of existence wherein activities are, are happening, but in one sense, it's not touching the person, but it's all happening on the mental platform. So the same thing in material life is the same. We think we're this body, and because we think we're this body, we think that the activities of the bodily needs and the bodily responsibilities are actually the fulfillment of the happiness that we're looking for in life. And therefore, the mind is a creation of the desires that we have for material enjoyment. The material mind is the covering over the spiritual mind. The soul also has a mind, but that mind is pure. And it's the shadow of that, that pure mind is the material mind. Just like the shadow of a person, it looks like the same person, but it is only a shadow and has no substance. The material mind has no substance, but it's the creation due to the association with matter that the soul has been sojourning life after life, performing activities based on material existence. So we create this false sense of existence and it starts within the mind. The mind, and then it expands itself out in the senses, the intelligence, like that. The mind is in the mode of goodness. The intelligence is in the mode of passion. The false ego is in the mode of ignorance. From the false ego, the mind comes 
And using the intelligence, it tries to fulfill its desire for material enjoyment, material supremacy. So all these are shadows, reflections of the reality. The reality is that the soul is part and parcel of Krishna, and it can never perform any spiritual, any material activities. But it's in it, but being diluted by the material energy, it falls into the category of, of uh, temporality, trying to enjoy this material world. But the soul is not touched by matter. <laughs> although it appears to be, just like a person in a dream is not touched by the dream on the physical level, generally. That's just a, that's a loose analogy. Because when you wake up, you realize, you know, you, know, you might have been chased by a tiger in a dream. When you wake up, there's no tiger. <laughs> it's just an, an illusion. So this material world is also like that. We're dreaming, we're women, we're dreaming, we're men. We're dreaming we have, you know, we have so many things. We're dreaming we're old, we're young. And none of these things apply to the soul. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm still thinking about how how we came into the material world then, because coming coming here isn't a material desire or or how how should I understand that part? Let's mention in a second, in Canto, the desire for supremacy, the desire for independence. The soul is by nature independent, but its independence becomes uh, realized when it's connected with the Supreme Lord. But the false independence is the is the is the consciousness that the, the soul developed, wanted to be separate from the supreme, and be independent, and then from there one falls into the material world to try to fulfill that desire. Mm -hmm. Personal personal endeavors for independence and prosperity based on the soul's position. Mm -hmm. I just read that just a few days ago in the second canto, in one of the purposes. Yeah, even in this material world, we still use that sense of independence. It's like we might join a spiritual movement, and still we want to be independent and do things our own way. <laughs> mm -hmm. Even follow the instructions of the spiritual movement. Yeah. That desire for independence is so strong that it, it takes one, it takes one, in so many areas of activity to fulfill that desire to do things the way I want to do, because I think I know better and what is best for me, or just to exercise one in one's independence, mm -hmm. which is which is a false, which is sin. Nobody's independent. So as soon as you try to become independent of Krishna, you become you become placed under the 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 influence of the external energy. So the independence is not real because now you're under another energy, which is the uh, what is called the Bahiranga Shakti or the the uh, uh, external energy of the Lord. Just like a person knows that. If I steal, if I commit a crime, I'll go to jail. But still, I want to do it. I want to exercise my independence not to follow the laws of the state. All right, so then I get caught, I get punished, and then that, that independence now is becomes uh, facilitated by the jail. So now the jail is the same thing. It, it is created by the state to punish those who want to be independent of the laws of the state. Similarly, the external energy of, of the material energy, the external energy is created by Krishna to, to capture and control the living entity who wants to be independent of Krishna. So the same energy is created by Krishna to restrict that soul from being independent and because there's no question of independence, so we're either, either under the spiritual energy or the material energy, even one. To be under the spiritual energy means to be independent. 
to be under the spiritual uh, material energy means to be dependent on the external energy. Because in the spiritual energy, we can exercise our ways to serve Krishna in different ways. That's our independence. Oh, uh, thank you. It's uh, it's really a lot to digest. Uh, it's just, I I think I have to re-evaluate my, my concept of... Uh, of material and spiritual, because I always thought that whatever is connected to Krishna is uh, spiritual and whatever is, uh, how to say, indirectly uh, connected to him and uh, not connected to him is material. But uh, as I understand, uh, this desire for independence or this so-called independence, uh, probably because we are not in the material world originally, uh, but still we have this desire I, I'm not sure if, if this is material or, or not. It is. It's material. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The thing is, you can't be independent. Krishna says, Yegatam Ramprapad Yante Tamsta Taiva Bajami Aham Mama Bartmanu Vartante Manusya Parta Sarvashyaha. Everyone follows my path in all respects, O son of Prita. So everyone, so he. Krishna lays down the path for re-entering into the spiritual process, and that is bhakti yoga. But those who don't follow that and they want to stay within the material world and try to, that's also Krishna's path. Mm -hmm. But it's a different type of path which leads to bondage and control by that same energy that they try to enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> No one can be independent of God because God, God's energy is working completely in all, aspe all aspects of life. One is the elevating energy and the other one is the punishing energy. Material energy punishes those who want to be independent of the Lord. And that's why no one in the material world is happy because they're acting against uh, the laws of God, which is the laws by which one develops their relationship with God, which is the foundation for returning back to the spiritual world. The material world is, is designed to bring you back to the spiritual world if you follow the process. Thank you. Thank you, Maharaj, for that uh, wonderful answer. And thank you, Mataji, uh, Radha Vinodini Mataji, for your question. Um, I think a Swadi uh, devotee is waiting for quite some time, raising his hand. Please go ahead. Thank you. Please accept my humble obeisances, dear Guru Maharaj. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Guru Maharaj, you mentioned that Srila Prabhupada said, of all my instructions, chanting 16 rounds every day is the most important instruction. So I was asked this question once when I was giving class that uh, we have only taken the vow of chanting 16 rounds every day and following the four regulative principles at the time of initiation. So what are your comments on attendance of the morning program? Uh, we have not taken vow that we will come for Mangalarti, Darshanati, Guru Puja, etc. But Srila Prabhupada said everyone should rise early, everyone should attend Mangalarti, come for morning and evening class and so on. But we have not taken that vow at the time of initiation. So what are your comments like this? So Guru Maharaj? Yeah, for those who are living in the temple, that is mandatory. Those who live outside, they may not be able to do that, but they should have some morning program at their home. Yeah. Comparable to fulfilling that same desire, actually. Because these morning programs purify our consciousness, focus our attention on the on devotion and the Supreme Lord. In the morning, early morning hours, which are the time that's ideal for spiritual practice. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Uh, but what Prabhupada is saying as far as everyone should attend Mangalar, he means everyone living in the temples. Mm -hmm. If you can live outside and you can go to Mangalarti, that's glorious. But if you can't, you should have some some means for performing some spiritual activities in your own home every day. Yes. Thank you, Mataji, for the wonderful Thank question. You. 
Yes, Maharaj Ji. Uh, well said. Yeah, morning sadhana is very important. Early morning sadhana, which is uh, during Brahma Murata, is considered to be the most, um, uh, you know, valuable time. You know, and uh, it's my experience um, doing morning sadhana, waking up at four o'clock, has uh, been a key to progress in this uh, mission. That's my experience, you know, because uh, we start our day with a good note. You know, we begin the day in Brahma Murad, chanting Hari Nam, you know, and then listening to Bhagavatam class. That's a uh, additional creep. That's a jam on the bread, you know. So, yeah, I, I would say yeah, morning sadhana is so important, so important to progress in this uh, Krishna Bhakti. Thank you, Mataji, for that wonderful question. And thank you, Maharaji, for the wonderful answer. Um, I I don't Maharaji, do you have some more time? It's uh, 6.30 uh, here. Can I take a... We got, some, we got yeah? some good questions left, yeah. Yeah, um, actually, Sukrakara Prabhuji, I see his raised hand again. Uh, yes, Prabhuji, go ahead, and then I'll read the uh, the chat box as well. Sukrakara Prabhuji. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Maharaj, actually, I read one. Uh, thank you, Mataji. I read one Prabhupada's uh, lecture today, and he has uh, clearly told that we are all stuck in the material world mainly because of sex desires. And that was a half an hour lecture. And he has told that uh, even people who look at the woman lascivious way, even once, uh, they will be there for thousand days in the Yamalok and be beaten by so many things. And Bhakti Vikas Maharaj told once in the lecture that this TV is an idiot box. <clears throat> you should throw that from the house. You should not use the TV at all. And he has told that, especially when you go in the plane and all, they throw some films and all, and you watch. And, you know, the desire suddenly goes and look at some woman and that will use so many days of hellish uh, planet. So, so I think uh, what the Muslims are doing to cover the face, I, I feel that is more protective for men and women both. I want your comment. Yeah, Prabhupada said, because you can't avoid seeing the opposite sex, but if you look at that with the desire to enjoy, then that is... Uh, and that will take your consciousness down. Therefore, there is a restriction that one can uh, fulfill that desire through married life. Um, and that's, con that's, that's a sense of concessionary that, la that lasts for so many years and then one moves away for that in the later part of life. But... Uh, in, in, in the principle of uh, sex desire also has its subtle forms in profit, adoration, and distinction. So these things, even though one may not be engaged in gross sexual activities, if mm -hmm. they're looking for personal profit, some distinction, some glorification, in the their execution of devotional service, then that is another form of sex life on a subtle level. Profit, adoration, mm -hmm. And if, you don't cut, if you don't cut the root, if you don't cut the root at the subtle level, mm. it'll go back to the gross level again because the subtle level is the foundation by which all of these things spring from. And so, uh, mm. just like when you have a, a, a if you're cutting grass uh, or mm. you're pulling out weeds, if you just cut the weeds at the level of the ground, the root of the weed stays in the ground and will grow back up again. But if you pull it out from the root, then it, it's gone. Same way that these subtle aspects of uh, material enjoyment, profit, adoration, distinction, as mentioned, are also forms of subtle sex desire. And if they're not uprooted, they will also, again, manifest in the form of the gross so one has to be very diligent to uh, keep the mind focused on Krishna. That's the whole process. <clears throat> keep the mind focused on Krishna. You have a choice where you want to put your mind. So don't be controlled by the mind. You control the mind. Bring the mind to the things that are spiritual, that elevate your consciousness. You yeah. have that choice every moment. 
when the thoughts so enter into the mind, if they're not spiritual, push them out and then bring in spiritual thoughts. And chant the holy names of the Lord. Think of the deity form of the Lord. And then all of these desires for material enjoyment will gradually become less and less. And as we purify our consciousness by bringing our consciousness to Krishna more and more, then at one point they're gone. And the mind is becoming somewhat purified. It's purified and it reflects Krishna at every moment. And so that is the process. You know, you can't allow these subtle forms to remain thing. They are even though one is free oh. from the gross forms. So, so, uh, so you, you may say that puja man pratishtha also is a dangerous thing which will drag you to the gross level. The puja man pratishtha, that adoration, not glorification. Um, yeah, Pratishta, puja, these are all these are all forms of subtle subtle desires. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj, for that wonderful answer. Um especially, I don't think... Yeah, especially Pratishta. Pratishta is the is the foundation by which is the last last straw of the material energy that one mm -hmm. is Forming devotional service now wants to be known as a great devotee of the Lord, or one even thinks I'm an incarnation of the Lord. <laughs> because devotional service is so powerful that one is tapping into the essence of that power. One becomes very powerful by devotional service. And if one if that power is not understood through the process of humble bhakti. One doesn't practice humility, then that power will make one think that you know, hey, I need, I want some worship. I'm a great devotee. I'm advanced. I'm better than others. I should get some facilities. Of these are all indications of that. Even though one is advanced in devotional service, they haven't curtailed that their the understanding of their position which is to become completely dependent on the mercy of the Lord at every moment and know that whatever they can do is simply the mercy of the Lord. That's all. If we think we can do something <clears throat> of the mercy of the Lord, we may be able to do something for a little while, but ultimately that will, will catch up with us. So well, in the, chopper, the, the devotee doesn't take credit. For whatever they do, they give credit to the Lord, they give credit to their spiritual master. Guru Maharaj. A real well, devotee is not interested. Yeah, let me finish, will you please? Yeah. Uh, yeah. A real devotee is not the real devotee is not uh looking for anything but to serve the Lord and to please the Lord, to serve the devotees, to please the devotees. That is what a devotee that what makes up devotional service. They would a uh, devotee doesn't perform devotional service for some material gain. Rupa Goswami speaks about that. And uh, Bhakti Siddhanta Swaraswati talks about the end result of such devotion is a desire for pratishta, which is to become known as a great devotee. And then one starts to speculate and create their own process of devotional service within devotional service. One may even break away from the from the society of devotee and try to start their own movement, thinking they have understood even more. These are all symptoms of this pratishta, which is uh, which is a subtle form of sex desire. So, if you understand you, these five principles, then you can recognize <laughs> when the mind and starts to start facilitating these desires. Oh yes, I'm advanced. I'm better than others. People are offering me obeisances. People are chanting my glories. Obviously I'm I'm in, you know I'm I'm advanced. But this is called Taranga Taranga what is that? Taranga Tarangini. Uh, Tarangini is the word. That means taking the accoloids of devotional service and seeing them as the indications of one's spiritual advancement. Because I have position, Ranga, Ranga Tarangini, it's called. Bhakti, uh, Sila, 
Vishwanath Chakravarti talks about that in Madhurya Kundalini. Ranga Tarangini means that, all right, I got followers, I'm getting wealth, I get position, wherever I go, I get flower garlands, you know. Hey, I'm advanced. <laughs> So that, that these are accoloids that come by way of Krishna's mercy upon the devotee, but they're not indications of one spiritual advancement. They might be slight indications, but what the real indication is, how much they're developing their love for Krishna and how much they're detached from everything in this material world. That is the indication of advancement. Thank you very much, Maharaj. That's so clear. How much, how much they're eager to associate and serve devotees, how much they're eager to chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, how much they're eager to hear the classes and to read the books. These are indications of one's advancement. Not the external forms that come in the form of, of the benefits that devotional service brings on the material level. One has, that's a very subtle, and many, many senior devotees have fallen prey to that. And I use the word many because it's the indication. Yeah. But now we have all of the scriptural uh, statements to help us understand what is real bhakti and what is what it looks like bhakti, but is contaminated with something. Uh, temporary or something material, some pseudo forms of bhakti. Is it, 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 just like it says, when you plant a seed in the ground, and then you the watering process is there, and by the watering process, the seed, along with the cultivation of the ground and giving it proper care, the seed starts to grow into a plant. But mm -hmm. Also, when you're watering the ground, you're also watering the re weeds that are around the plant, and they also can grow. So if one is not aware of those weeds, it can choke up, the, choke out the real plant, just like a creeper chokes out the plant of, a, of, a, of something that it's in its, in its area. You see how creepers wrap around themselves around a tree, and they can even suck out the life of the tree. And that's the power of the creep. So these weeds are like these the material desires. They spring up from bhakti. They come by way of bhakti. They're not bhakti. They're just simply growing with the devotional service of the uh, of the jiva. It, both of them are growing at the same time. But one has to be aware of that and say, "Oh yes, I'm, I'm feeling proud. I'm looking for adoration." When I don't get it, I feel unhappy like that. Or, you know, these are all subtle forms of, uh, of contamination. And if they're not removed initially, then eventually they'll grow to such a way that one will fall down from devotional service. And one will even think, I know more than the spiritual master. The spiritual master knows a lot, but he hasn't given yeah. me everything. I've understood other things. Yeah. yeah. The so spiritual big. master has made a mistake. He he had written the Srimad Bhagavatam in the fifth canto. He's made so many mistakes about the cosmological arrangements of the universe. Therefore, we know because we have studied what the scientists have said and we have understood. And it's, you know, so they take issue with Srila Prabhupada's fifth canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam. They take his statements out of context and give it a different definition and, and then criticize that different definition, which is not really the meaning of the spiritual master. Yeah, so this goes on. This goes on. Okay, thank you, Maharaj, for that. Thank wonderful. you so much. Thank you so much, Manfi. So much you have explained. Thanks so, a lot, Maharaj. We, I Thank don't have blessings. to hands raised anymore. But I do have a few questions in the chat box, Maharaj. Would you like to... <coughs> I'll just read them quickly. Um, so this is uh, Hemi Mataji says, Hare Krishna Maharaj, Dhanavad Pranam. Beautiful class. Thank you. I just wanted to know if there is specific recommendation in terms of how much time 
we should devote in personal reading of Srila Prabhupada's book and much how much time to be devoted in hearing lectures over and above hearing the morning Bhagavatam class daily. Well, Srila Prabhupada's made some statements regarding the times that we should dedicate to these things, but ultimately the principle is as much time as you can. <laughs> But if you're looking for a standard by which you can organize your day-to-day -day schedule, he did say we should read our the, read his books one to two hours every day. Minimum one, well, one to two hours every day for reading. He said that. Um, it depends on what what your life is, how much you can. But minimum at least an hour or more every day. And Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavatam. Like that. He also said different statements. Sometimes he said two hours. One time he said five hours. So Prabhupada will use different statements. And uh, one can see. In our temples, he wanted, he wanted our temples to be places of education where people come in and hear the classes all day. In the Chaitanya Charitamrita, he writes that there should be glorification of the Lord throughout the whole day, which means hearing the glories of the Lord through discussion, through classes, seminars, and various types of educational programs. And in the evening, he said three hours of kirtan every night in every one of our temples. Mm -hmm. So that is Prabhupada, we don't follow Prabhupada because we think he's it's too too impractical, too difficult. So we adjust. When you start adjusting, what happens is you it becomes a, a process of adjustment. Then you adjust again, adjust again, and pretty soon, and then pretty soon the essence is lost. <laughs> Correct. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And another question I see, Hare Krishna Maharaj Ji, senior devotees having wedge cook and offer to Lord and have as prasad. How you will teach on this situation? Cook is wedge, but doesn't chant at all. Doesn't know anything about Krishna consciousness. Is this practice accepted? We, 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 I think we discussed that. that exactly, yeah. Anyone yeah. who's cooking for the deity, yeah. if they're cooking at home, they should chant at least four rounds. Mm -hmm. if, they're, if they're in the temple, then they have to follow the temple protocol, which means they should be uh, second initiated. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, you answered that already, Maharaj Ji. Yeah, thank you so much. I don't see any more raised hand. Um, well, I... See another. Uh, uh, I don't see any other questions here, so I think I've... there is one more raised hand. Oh, let me see. Maybe. Oh, there you go. Okay, Swati Mataji, yeah, go ahead, please. You can go ahead. Thank you so much for your kindness, uh, Guru Maharaj. I have a question regarding this pratishtha. When we are planning activities, when we are planning services, when we are thinking we want to do like this, we want to uh, expand uh, Srila Prabhupada's mission or so on and so on, uh, there may be de definitely that desire to please Prabhupada, to please the spiritual master. But unconsciously, how do we know that the desire for pratishta is also not lurking in the background. And if that is the case, how can we eliminate that and make our desires pure? Yeah, these things are subtle. Sometimes they're, they're so, so subtle, only other people can see it, and you can't even see it in yourself. But mm -hmm. therefore, one should try to Offer it with a desire to please. That's all. Put your own desires in the background and put the desire to please Krishna in the foreground. That's all. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Thank you, Mati. in all of the activities we perform. Yeah. 
Okay, so I don't see any more raised hand. Thank you very much, Maharaji, for that uh, answer. And uh, we could end this call since there is no more raised hand. Thank you so much, uh, Maharaji, for coming on the call. And uh, thank you so much. We are so fortunate to have your association. We look forward to your association again in the future. And um, uh, I would like to you know, end this call. And let's uh, if you keep praying. If you keep praying, if you keep praising me, I won't be here for very, very long. And uh... <laughs> he's praising it. praising you is like praising the Lord. You all are our spiritual masters, you know, and we are so so grateful to have your association, Maharaj. So let us praise you, okay? So let's pay our obeisance to Maharaj. One Jai. 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 Jai.